Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is good, isn't he? I set up my tablet so it would open by punching the right places on the screen. I can't ever seem to hit the right places. It was easier to type in the password. <clears throat> but I got it, so we can uh, proceed. Speaking of vision, we, uh, I did this last Friday. What day is this? This must be Sunday. Y'all are here. Um, we... Uh, <laughs> We committed, or we sh maybe we should be committed. Maybe that's um, that we're going to do another conference in Peru this year, um, and we uh, firmed up the dates last night for the uh, the uh, leadership summit in Jamaica, <coughs> March the 20th through the 22nd, with uh, Pastor Orton Deans, and uh, so. We're going to go do that one, and uh, if nothing happens before today's over, we'll be trying to schedule another one. Uh, that's a long story about why it has to be today being over, but, um, but if today goes by without uh, somebody getting back to me about one country, uh, we're just going to pass them on by and go to another one. We're going to do a, another conference, hopefully in sometime in September in Belize, amen, and uh, I'd like to go back to Guatemala this year, but uh, we, we, uh, we're, we'll work on that. But we, we also have plans rolling for uh, Mexico City. And, of course, Hermosillo, the Bible school there, continues apace. <laughs> so we're just waiting for the confirmed dates for the rest of this year uh, for that. Other than that, we don't have anything to do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I probably forgot something along the way. So uh, bear those things in your, in your prayer time uh, because uh, lack of... Sun I, I've always wondered, ever since I got uh, born again and I read my Bible and saw where it said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. I'm thinking, I'm not a great Bible scholar, but I'm thinking damned is probably not good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, I remember sitting on the edge of my bed in my, in my beat-up, nasty apartment where I lived when I sobered up, and I had a, a, a Good News Bible because I, I couldn't read the, new, the King James because it was a little too thick for me. I had to find some. This one, my, my Good News Bible had stick figures in the margins. <laughs> anybody, anybody remember those? So the Bible stories, you know, it had little stick figures illustrating the Bible story. That was right about my speed, about about a fourth grade level reading with stick figures. I say, okay, we're good. So I'm sitting in there on the edge of my bed reading the red. Anybody know about reading the red? Yeah. Amen. I remember years ago, Larry Lee talking about reading the red and praying for the power. And <laughs> so I'm reading the red, and uh, I'm thinking, you know, in the, in the, we won't name the denomination, but in the church or two churches I went to when I was a kid, I don't remember them telling me about this about laying hands on the sick and casting out devils and preaching the gospel around the world. Uh, I, I know they must have. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I wasn't the best audience, you know. <laughs> so I'm thinking about how to get out and get a beer and chase a woman. But, but <laughs> So probably I wasn't listening. And I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But, but I'm reading that, and I'm th all of a sudden I had this thought. Man, somebody ought to be telling people about that. Now, that may not sound like, like much of a Damascus Road experience to you, <laughs> but it scared the heck out of me because I knew there wasn't anybody else in the room, so I threw that Bible back up under the bed because I thought, uh-oh, that's a bad sign. But I still think that's true. Somebody ought to be telling people about this. I mean, if this is true, somebody ought to be, you know, trying to inform people because they're in a mess out there. So uh, I've never understood people that were bored. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be unkind if you're bored, but uh, they're going to hell out there as fast as they can go, and my theory has always been if the best I can do is try to trip them, <laughs> get, them get them down before they go, you know, <laughs> at least give them a good talking to before they jump into hell without, without anybody telling them. But if, the, if the best I can do is run out in the street and trip them on the way, then that's, you know, I, that, I, I don't want to do them a disservice by just letting them go to hell w without me telling them about it. So, so I've been running as fast as I can go ever since. A couple of days later, I crawled back up under the bed and got the Bible out again. <laughs> Wouldn't leave me alone. Amen. <clears throat> so uh, we're still running, 
And the, the reason I said all that was, was uh, to tell you this. I was on the phone with Gail Buse, the, uh, uh, I forget, she's the missions lady for FCF International. And we were running down the list of stuff. She just got back from Kenya and Rwanda before Christmas. And, and she was here in March, if you were, were here for those meetings. She's, she's a huge blessing. And uh, her husband Bob and I uh, went to Mexico City together several years ago. And he's a good man. Was the missions director for many years. And, uh, but anyway, we were talking, and she was talking about Belize and Guatemala and Peru and all the places that we've been and plowed some ground, you know. And then she said this phrase, and it just blessed me. I, laid, I woke up at 3.30 th this morning thinking about this phrase. She said, uh, and for all of those, I want if, uh, for you or some of your team to go. Now, I don't know if that did anything for you or not. But when I heard somebody who I don't know that I've ever used that terminology with her, but when she said, some of your team, I thought somebody who travels the world and travels from church to church and from ministry to ministry uh, looked at our church, has visited our church, and has been around us, and she thinks we got a team. <laughs> Amen. I bless my socks off. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Exactly. Exactly. We got a real church. It's not just Uncle Virgil and the children anymore. <laughs> Amen. It's Pastor Virgil, the folks at FCF Tucson, and the team. Glory to God. Look at somebody and say, we on the team. The team. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. That just, I, that made my week. <laughs> Amen. Unsolicited. She doesn't even know she said it. I'm sitting here on the phone just grinning. My team. We'll send some of my team. All right. <laughs> blessed me. Blessed me. Blessed me. That means that she knows there would be no drop off in quality in the ministry. Amen. Because she wouldn't send the second team. She'd send the first team. We're going to send the first team. We don't have a second team. Amen. Amen. Well, glory. Let's read Matthew chapter 9. Is there anybody on the overhead that can use a projector? Go check your email for the FCFT office account and click on the Dropbox link. Sometimes you have to get these kids up to speed on this technological stuff, you know. <laughs> Y'all are laughing. I was programming computers when most of you weren't even born yet. <laughs> First computer I ever programmed it was in 1964, so that's what I mean, before most of you were born. <laughs> Amen. So I'm not completely in the dark on some of this stuff, but boy, have they gotten faster. We had a, the first one I worked on was a computer that was the size of probably three times the size of this building, not just this part of the building, but this whole building. And the computer was housed in the building. There was a little lobby, and then you went through a door into the rest of the building where the computer was. They had thousands of megatons of air conditioning running to try and keep it cool because it was all vacuum tubes in big banks, floor to ceiling with aisles between the banks of tubes. And they had guys with, with grocery carts full of tubes walking up and down the aisles replacing the tubes as they burned out. That was their whole day's work was keeping those tubes replaced. <laughs> and you know what? Your phone <laughs> has way more power than that whole building <laughs> in 1964. <laughs> they since leveled the building in the National Weather Service is there now. But <laughs> Amen. So anyway, my point being that some of these kids, you know, haven't been around much. I have to tell them how to check email. There should be an email there to the office account. Did you find them? Oh, okay. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Chapter 10 and verse 1, of course, uh, tells us that he didn't just ask for laborers, he sent laborers. So we, we talked about how that passage has been seminal in the growth and development of Faith Christian Fellowship of Tucson from the beginning, that we're uh, in the business of sending laborers into the harvest, responding to the compassion of the Lord. And we talked a lot about uh, what that had meant for us since February of 2004. And in 2014, uh, the word the Lord gave that John was referring to is, uh, we are now a real church with a sustainable base and a long reach. Amen? Everybody say long reach. long reach. It's time to impact Tucson and beyond. We looked at the, what it meant to be a real church. And I'll just read you some of it. I think I put most of it in your, in your uh, bulletin. A real church, real means without pretense or artifice. Amen. Genuine, authentic, relating to practical everyday life, not fake or fraudulent. Fundamental, essential, fixed, permanent, and immovable. This is not a circus or a stage performance. It's the people of God striving together to follow God individually and corporately through His Word and His Spirit. The big question then becomes, what does a real church full of real disciples, do to really impact its community and the world? And that's the question we're in the process of trying to answer, at least for the short haul. Amen. 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 You're already experiencing some of that uh, because uh, we didn't just start doing this yesterday. We've been working uh, with a vision and a plan from the first day. Amen. And God just keeps kind of tweaking it for us. We have a plan and a process for accomplishing this purpose. And just for a moment, I want to just review the plan with you. For some of you who are newer, you may not know the plan, and some of you who have been here, you probably didn't pay any attention the last time I talked about it. <laughs> so faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Lord told us three years ago to be an organic church. An organic church grows from the roots up. Amen. Uh, Judy had the, the good sense to put that tree on the overhead this morning. And uh, I didn't know she had that because I went to the trouble to find another one. Because we, we, I, I found it impossible to personally reproduce the tree that I drew for our leadership. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was erased off the whiteboard. Amen. And the National Museum of Arts will not be able to get it. <laughs> Just take my word for it. I can't even write, much less draw. So uh, the tree, however, represented uh, what we're doing in terms of growing a church. Organic church means we're growing the things that God plants here. Amen. Amen. Did we find it yet? All right, shoot me the one that says tree on it. There you go. It's not too bad, huh? <laughs> Amen. Not too bad for five in the morning with a mouse, huh? <laughs> Amen. Uh, we pointed out that, that organic means that the fruit is born out there on the ends of the branches. Not so, you never see a tree with just a root coming up out of the ground and the apple sitting on it. <laughs> right? Fruit's born out on the ends of the branches. And our church grows as an organic endeavor. It's, it's not, you see, the, the, the opposite of that, the way that uh, we used to do church, the way I did church every time until I did this church, was I had a number of ministries and boxes with their name on it. I had your youth and your children and your toddlers and your evangelistic and your missions, and we needed a, a people to populate each one of them boxes to have a proper church. But we've really tried this time around to do it a little different. It's gotten much more refined as we've gone along. Some stuff has to happen. You've got to have a box called cleaning. <laughs> Amen. And you've got to constantly be shoving people in there. <laughs> and you've got to have a box entitled diaper changers. <laughs> Amen. So, I mean, there's some stuff just has to happen so you can have church. Amen. But even in those situations, you're constantly looking for somebody that's actually got that 
in their heart. Because once you get the person that's got that in his heart, you can quit worrying about it. You can just start building and encouraging and training that person, and the ministry takes care of itself. Why? Because it's in the heart of a person. Are you, are you with me? Amen. That's what we mean by organic. Now, some people get grafted into our tree from outside. But, you know, when you graft something into a tree, you know what graft is? Where you cut a hole in the tree and get a branch off, the, off another tree and poke it in there and you grow cherries on an apple tree? <laughs> Amen. Amen. You can. Amen. You know what that... So when you graft somebody in, it takes a little while for the life of this tree to flow out into that branch. So if you come in and you want to just run off, you know, and do your thing out of here, and, and I seem a little bit hesitant about that, that's because I want to make sure that the life and the flow of this place is flowing in your veins. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Before we turn you loose in our name. Does that make sense to you? Organic means you have to be connected to the roots. Amen. So if you haven't got juice from the roots yet, then you hang around long enough to get it, and then we'll turn you loose. Amen. Praise God. And then, uh, obviously, the ones that we grow from here that have been wandering around, either unchurched people. I used to call them underchurched people. There are a lot of underchurched people. Amen. <laughs> they may have a church somewhere, but it ain't enough church to do any good. Amen. So if you've been underchurched, unchurched, or unsaved, and you come here and plant, then we just grow you from a pup. And there's people in this room today that don't know any better. What do you mean? I mean, they go to another church. They say, you wouldn't believe what they were doing. Yes, I would. That's what they've been doing for the last four centuries, and they're still doing it. Well, I told them, we don't do it that way. They don't care. They think you're crazy, so just smile and bless them and go on. Amen. I like that when people come back and say, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, I would. I used to go to that church. <laughs> and I was under church, just like you were. So when I'm talking about organic church, I'm talking about something that starts from the root that the Lord planted, grows up, and can, notice, fruit has to be what? Connected. Okay? So uh, we've been talking a lot this last year about helping to get people connected. Now, uh, throw me the other one up there. Uh-oh. There you go. This is our flow chart. You didn't know you were in a flow chart, did you? Well, you are. So the moment you hit the front door, you have entered the flow chart. Up until, go, go up a little bit. I want to see the bottom of the flow chart first. Because up until about three years ago, we were really good at hiding my pointer. There it is. We were, I say really good. I thought we did a pretty good job of moving people from this part right here down to this part, right? Once we got people to the, to the membership lunch and we got them plugged in, we had a plan in place for finding them a place of service and for training them. And, uh, of course, we have FMTI, which has always been the heart of this church. Faith Ministry Training Institute, our Bible school classes, have, uh, we just keep cranking people through there. Amen. Uh, one guy asked me pretty recently, he said, why, why should uh, we use your Bible school program? I said, because it works. <laughs> How do you know it works? I know it works because I see those people. I know it works, amen, because I see those people. I know it works because I see those people. Come on. <laughs> I know it works because I see those people. I know it works uh, because I see those people. Where are they? There are them Puerto Rican people back there. There we are. <laughs> I know it works. Amen. I, Amy, I know it works because I see that person. Oh, here you are, right here in the front. I know it works because I see those people. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Amen. I know it works because why? I can see the results. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It works. Turns disciples, good disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, into ministers of the gospel. Praise God. At whatever place the God, that God called them to. We were pretty good at that. Training people and ginning them up and getting them fired up. I'll miss this row. I know it works because of this person. I mean, there, it's, a, it's, it's hard to deny at this point. The proof of the pudding, as they say. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we were pretty good at that, but it dawned on me that we weren't doing a very good job of getting people from the front door 
getting them connected and keeping them plugged in long enough to get them to that membership lunch and start training them and, and putting them into service. Amen. I mean, once we got them, they're hooked. But we're not, we weren't hooking them, I didn't think. Because the, what the Lord said to me uh, was that I send them to you and you let them get away. And uh, what he, uh, really what I, I, I think he showed me was this. When people come here, you can turn the lights back on. Uh, it's on purpose. Nobody came here by accident. You can't find this place by accident. I can't find it half the time and I work here. <laughs> I tell you what, when we moved over here, I thought, boy, this is going to be a disaster. Nobody, because we don't have any drive-by business, no, no place to put a sign. The city wants half your life savings and your firstborn child to put a sign up. That's a racket, by the way. Amen. It is a racket. Amen. I won't go into that. But it's, a, it's all about contractors in the city having an inbred system of making one another rich. That's what it's about. It's not about the sign. They couldn't give her anything about the sign. <laughs> it's about making money. Amen. At your expense. So, that's another subject. But uh, the Lord pointed out to me that when people came in this door, uh, they were here on purpose because He brought them. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Uh, they found, uh, found us in any, any number of ways, but they found us, and it sure wasn't by driving by. <laughs> Some of them drove by six, seven times trying to find it, and they were looking for it. <laughs> and yet we just kept on growing, and people kept on coming. Well, uh, I thought we, we need a better way to plug people in, because his desire is that even if they don't go to Bible school, even if they don't become a member of the church, even if they don't uh, hook up with this church permanently, that he wants them to be real disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that that's our job is to disciple the ones that come in the door. At least if they'll let us. I mean, you, don't, you can't tie them down and make them, you know. But, well, that's a thought. <laughs> Bob, you tackle them and I'll teach them, all right? <laughs> Or the other way around, that'd be fine. <laughs> Amen. No, I don't think that I don't think we could get away with that for any length of time. We've known some people that tried that over the years, but it doesn't work very well, and you go to jail. So, <laughs> so we started coming up with some other ideas about how to get people connected. Amen. To the tree, to the organism, and. Uh, in the process of that, we came up with what we've, we've uh, uh, called our direct... You can put that thing back up there now. Maybe you can. There we go. That big oval up there is all the different things that we have going on. Uh, we quit having just regular old greeters, but instead of just greeters, we had connection representatives that, tra that chase people down and make sure they've got in enough information Amen. That they can go home and become a disciple if they never come back, number one. Number two, that they met somebody as part of this congregation, that they have a face and a name so that they feel not just greeted but welcomed. Amen. That the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ has been genuinely extended to them by somebody that gives a rip about them following Jesus. Are you with me? So that's been part of the plan, and that hasn't been all that easy because I didn't know anybody else that did that. So we kind of had to invent that wheel. But you know what? We're getting better at it, and we're about to tweak it again. Amen. To get even better at it yet. But to all of those, the, the home groups, that's a result of that. Places for people to connect face-to-face -face with people. Because you see, right now, you don't have a relationship with Roy. Roy's looking at the back of your head. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Could be any other brunette in the world in front of him. He wouldn't know. Amen. But when you get together at home and sit down and talk about the Word together and pray for one another, uh, then all of a sudden there starts to be a connection that's human. Amen. That's where fruit's born, where connections are made. Are you listening to me? So we've worked a lot at that over the last two or three years, and we're continuing to do that so that we can be organic church. Moving people, we say, first from the front door to the membership table making real disciples and then moving them from the pew into the harvest, getting them in the service of the Lord. 
You see, the primary purpose of the five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, as it's enumerated in Ephesians chapter 4 and the 11th verse, the primary purpose, as it's, as it's uh, laid out in the 12th verse of that same chapter, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The saints are supposed to be doing the work of the ministry, and in order to do that, you have to equip them. You have to train them. You have to give them the tools. You have to give them the confidence. Pastor John was talking about the class that's coming up. That was the whole purpose of that class. I want you to feel like you got the goods when you run up against something. Amen. And if you have to say, wait a minute, I've got to go get my notebook out of my car. I'll be right back. That'll be all right. Amen. But at least you know where to go. Amen. you got a clue. Praise God. Amen. So, uh, we've been uh, doing our best from a pastoral standpoint to fulfill that calling. We cast vision, all right. We talk about plans and purposes, and you understand that when you come here and people are trying to get you plugged in somewhere, that's because there's a plan and a purpose to move you to where you need to be to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not interested in drawing a crowd. If I wanted to draw a crowd, I'd give away free beer and have naked women. It works. But you see, we have cross-purposes there. Amen. Drawing a crowd's not the point. Making disciples is the point. Amen. So we want to tailor the program to make disciples. Amen. If you make enough disciples, drawing a crowd won't be a problem. Because disciples reproduce. Hallelujah. So, this year, the Lord spoke to me about two specific things that I needed to warn you all about. Number one, as your instructor, preparer, and vision and direction giver, you need to be aware that this is going to be a year when you need to stay focused on what's important. Because the world around you, if you haven't noticed, is nuts. <laughs> and they will try to draw you into their discussion of all the nutty stuff. I got an email from a friend in Denmark this week. Said she was going to have to turn off the TV because the news was driving her crazy. She was a news junkie. Anybody be guilty to that? Amen. If you watch that long enough, it'll make you insane. Amen. Amen. So the world around us, and, all, and some of our, even our Christian brethren, they fight over all kinds of crazy stuff. Amen. I just refuse to engage in the controversy and go on down the highway. Why? Because he's told us what to do. We have a job to do. We have a purpose and a plan in place. Let's work the plan. Amen. And if people don't want to get on board with us, just wave goodbye and say, God bless you, and go on to the next one. Amen. Amen. The, Jesus talked about it. Paul talked about it. He said, sometimes you just got to kick the dust off your shoes and go on. Amen. Some people are just not interested. And that's okay. Maybe somebody else will get them. Amen. Then the other thing, that he talked to me about was in Ezekiel chapter 3. Let us turn over to Ezekiel chapter 3. Now I've got to punch this thing again. I hit it first time that time. must be God. <laughs> Ezekiel, the third chapter. I talked to you last time. I th I, somebody told me I didn't finish my story last week about having, to, having a dream about standing next to a, on a platform next to a black man. Y'all remember that story? Yeah. In my dream, I was at Rhema the first year, still in the first semester. And I had a dream about standing uh, next to a black man on a little platform. I had a little pulpit there, and there was a, a kind of a blue-gray wall behind us. And we were preaching together. I didn't understand what that meant at the time. I mean, that was 1980. In 1991, I'm standing in Jeremy, Haiti, uh, under a tin roof on a little platform about this big with a pulpit standing there and this black man standing on the other side there. Good friend of mine, now. <laughs> and we're standing there preaching. I'm preaching in English. He's interpreting into Creole. And behind us, there's a blue-gray wall. Amen. Eleven years later, I'm standing on that platform and looked around and thought, Son of a gun. <laughs> really, I mean, I had one of those moments. Go, can you beat that? 
See, some of y'all think it's going to happen day after tomorrow if the Lord speaks to you about something. <laughs> Amen. That one was 11 years coming, and when I got it, I didn't even know where the blue wall was. <laughs> First time the Lord said, go to Haiti, I had to go look it up. I didn't know where it was. I really didn't. I knew it was in the Caribbean somewhere, you know. Down, yon, down that way. <laughs> I'm an Oklahoma boy. We didn't know even how to find Texas, much less Haiti. <laughs> I could find Kansas because the drinking age was 18, so I knew how to get there. I thought they built I-35 just for me. <laughs> Oklahoma City to Wichita. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let's make a beer run. <laughs> Just take three or four hours. Amen. Drive off in Lake Ponca on the way back. <laughs> Amen. Well, I could tell some stories about that, but it wouldn't be church stuff. The, uh, <laughs> do you know it's hard to tow a sailboat with a, with a rope in your teeth? I mean, you've got to be a strong swimmer, brother. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Oh, Ezekiel chapter 3. So it was in this chapter that the Lord spoke to me in that dream. Go get ye to them of the captivity and to the children of thy people and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. That's the 11th verse. Amen. Two verses before that, he said, I'm going to give you a forehead harder than flint <laughs> because they're all not going to be real thrilled about your message. Amen. I learned that the hard way. But then in verse 12, he said, The Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great and thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from His place. I heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels beside them, and a great thunderous noise. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. Think about that for a minute. Sometimes the Lord wants you to go somewhere, and you may not be all that thrilled about it. I've had some of those conversations. Amen. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. There's the good part of that verse. I came to the captives of Tel Aviv who dwelt by the river Kabar, and I sat where they sat. I sat where they sat. I sat where they sat. Amen. One of the secrets of, of powerful ministry is being willing to put yourself in the other fellow's shoes before you say, here's what you ought to do. Amen. It's easy to sit in the stands and tell everybody what they ought to do. Something else to get out on the field and play a little bit and get a little bloody. Then you got a little better perspective. Amen. I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them for seven days. New Living Translation says, I was overwhelmed. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to, to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Is that in your Bible? His blood I will require at your hand. Remember what I said about tripping him? That, that Stokes is a very loose Oklahoma paraphrase of this whole passage. The least I can do is try to trip them on their way to hell. Why? Because otherwise they're going to go to hell and they're going to stand before the Lord and say, but Virgil didn't tell me. Amen. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Hallelujah. Amen. There's more along those lines there, but let's, let's stop right there. That's the gist of it. He, he, what he, this, he spoke this to me in November while I was away praying. He gave me this passage. I was reading my own special verse out of this chapter like I do every year, you know, and leaving the rest of it alone. And uh, the Holy Ghost prompted me, keep reading. Keep reading. It's time that we rise up and let Tucson know, amen, what it is that God's given us. Lest they die in their iniquity and their blood be on us. It's time to tell them. Amen. Time to find ways to tell them. It's time to impact Tucson and the world. Thank you, Jesus. You see, a real church preaches the gospel, amen, and doesn't just have church. Amen. So when I talk about impacting Tucson, it's because of what the Lord spoke to me out of Ezekiel chapter 3. 
We want to make sure that nobody from Tucson goes to hell without a, a good shot at receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, we're in the United States. Everybody knows the gospel. Half the church don't know the gospel. Amen. <laughs> I think half is probably a conservative figure. Because uh, for those of you that have been raised up here, most churches don't teach the Bible like we teach it here. I got news for you. <laughs> Amen. People go to church all their life and don't know squat doodly. Amen. So we don't want that to happen to everybody. We want to give them a, a chance anyway. Look with me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 6. If we're going to be a real church impacting Tucson, you have to start at the beginning. If we're going to be an organic church, every, everything in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God, everything in the Spirit starts in the Spirit first. There's another reason why. Uh, did you ever think about it? I, I didn't. Quite frankly, sometimes I'm really stupid. Uh, why, about the same time that we really started feeling the emphasis, or I started feeling the emphasis, I, these people have gone along with me, I guess they think it's okay, the, <laughs> about the organic church, about nurturing what God's put here, about that same time here, three or four years ago, he started really bugging me every year about turning up the prayer engine. Every year, I mean, the last three years for sure. You need to turn up the prayer engine, you need to turn up the prayer you need to, well, and he, interestingly enough, he did both of those things simultaneously. And I never put two and two together. <laughs> uh -huh. You know? I mean, sometimes I really am just reporting. I haven't really thought about it at all. I'm just telling you what he said. I guess he thought I'd be smart enough to figure out the connection, but I wasn't until this year. But you can't have an organic church without turning up the prayer engine. Because everything starts in the Spirit. Amen. God never works on us from the inside or from the outside in. He works on us from the inside out. And affecting the hearts of people has to start in the Spirit. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, the 18th through the 20th verse, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me, too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray I'll keep on speaking boldly for Him as I should. Uh, as we pointed out last year as we were talking about uh, the closet revival and praying in the Spirit, Every time he starts talking about interceding and praying, he never says pray for the world. He says pray for the saints and pray for the preachers. Over and over and over again. Why? Because if the saints and the preachers are doing their part, the world will be taken care of. Amen. Amen. That's hard for us to get a hold of. But if we're going to impact Tucson, we've got to get serious about praying for one another. Now, uh, we're pretty serious, I think, as most churches go, about our prayer situation here. When I say serious, I mean there is a plan in place. Amen. And uh, just in case you don't know what it is, I thought I'd just kind of run over it for you. Because we have uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, we have put in new levels of prayer every year. Every member of this church has somebody in leadership who is assigned to pray for them personally by name every day. I still think some people don't believe me, but is it true? Amen. rest of you leaders, is that true? Do I bug you about it every month of the world? Absolutely. <laughs> They're tired of hearing about it. Amen. Well, sometimes nagging works, you know. People do stuff just to get you off their back after a while. No, they're, uh, they're, they're plugged in. They're, they're committed. Amen to praying for the people that are part of their work, part of their area. And the, if you're part of the, the, uh, the toddler town ministry, then, uh, then Becky's got you. She has a list with your names on it. And we have a specific uh, prayer chart of what to pray for every day. We have a specific area of your life that gets prayed for every day, seven days a week, by name, by somebody personally. If you're in the worship team, then I'm praying for you. Every day. Amen. If you're in the media department, 
John's praying for you every day. Are you listening to me? Amen. If you're an usher, Leo's got you covered. If you're in the jail ministry, Mike's got you covered. Amen. So uh, why do you do that? Because I believe that people need to be prayed for. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to take a little side trip and cover the last of the message here. I, I have been fascinated by this scripture since I was in Ramah, which was a long time ago. Amen. Amen. And uh, I read this, and of course everybody gets upset about it because they, they talk about turning this old boy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. You may ever read that? He's, he's having some kind of sexual affair with his stepmother. Yeah. And uh, Paul is writing to the church. He says, y'all ought not be letting that go on. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> he didn't say that. That's Oklahoma translation. But... But that's weird. <laughs> Amen. He said, and he, he, the funny part is he was mad at the church. He wasn't mad at the old boy. He was mad at the church for letting it go on. Yeah. Come on. Nobody ever preaches that. But that'll preach. Yeah. Amen. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather together. When you're gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be there with you in the spirit. And I want you to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. He said, I, I want you to cut him loose. Turn him over to Satan. Notice who's going to do the destroying of the flesh. Keep that straight. And people think God does that stuff. He said, no, I want you to cut him loose so the devil can, can tear him up. Why? So he'll repent and get right because I want him to be saved. Notice the motive. The motive is always the salvation and the redemption of the individual, no matter how weird they are. Amen. Some of you ought to say amen to that. Aren't you glad he's concerned about you even if you're weird? Amen. Well, here's the thing that always, now people get into all kinds, there's reams written on that verse, on those verses, about what that means. What were they doing? Well, they were doing exactly what he said they were doing. If you want to know what it means, then, then read the book. I have a book on the subject called You're a Keeper. Amen. So, so read that book, and you'll be fine, or we'll preach it again sometime. But here's the thing that's always bugged me about that verse. These people had to have a prayer meeting, <laughs> amen, in order to allow the devil to attack one of the people in their church. You ever think about that? Not only that, not just anybody, but a guy that's sleeping with his stepmother. Yeah. Most of our prayer meetings are about getting the devil off of good people who are getting beat up. Yeah. Now, why is that? I think they were living in a level of having each other's back in the spirit that we have no clue about. The devil was unable to physically attack this man until the church gave him permission. Well, we're living way below that level of privilege, brother. Are you listening to me? Part of the problem is, as soon as we hear that somebody, no matter how wonderful they are, no matter how precious they are, we hear that something bad has happened to somebody in the church, the first question is, I wonder how they let the devil in. I wonder what they did. I wonder what they're not doing. They need more faith. They need to pray more. You know, they probably haven't been reading their Bible. You know, she wasn't at prayer meeting last week. We're just like those old boys in John chapter 9. Remember that story? The man born blind? Yeah. Yeah. And they come up on that old boy, and the first thing the disciples said, who sinned? Yeah. <laughs> Him or his parents? He was born blind, you doofus. They thought that the embryo sinned in the womb. That was the, the, that was the, the theology of the day because that's the only way their religious minds could explain it. Well, why was he born blind then? His parents didn't sin. Why? They said they didn't. <laughs> I have wonderful friends, love God, who've had children with physical problems and they beat themselves half to death because they think it was their fault because of their whatever they were doing. Some of them were doing some pretty weird stuff. But. Amen. 
And because of that mindset in the church, they're still thinking, yeah, I probably caused that. Well, first of all, even if you did, what good does it do for you to walk around like that? Suck it up and figure out what to do about it. I mean, for, for starters, figuring out who caused it is sort of a moot point. It's now, we got it now, so let's deal with it. But remember what Jesus said when he said, who sinned this man or his, or his parents? Remember what Jesus said? The, his answer to the question was, neither. Now, he just blew their theology out of the water because they thought that every bad thing that happened came as a result of personal sin. He said, neither. That was the answer to the question. He said, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to work the works of the one who sent me. What does that mean? I'm going to heal his eyes. Yeah. It don't matter what the cause of it was. It wasn't personal sin on the part of either one of them, by the way. It doesn't matter what it was. The works of God are what? Heal it. Yeah. But yet in the church, we still like them, them disciples, aren't we? I just wonder what they did to let that in. How many of you ever heard that, Pastor? Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to ask her a show of hands on anybody that's heard it today, but I would, I would suspect there's people at least had that thought today. Amen. Wouldn't it be great if instead of that, the first question that came from our mind, to our mind was, one of our church would have been attacked by the devil? Wow. I wonder who's supposed to be praying. How did we let down? Where did we fall down on, on our prayer to let that happen? That ought to be our first question. Man, we need to gin it up a little bit. Amen. So, that's the reason. Because I've been bugged about that for years. That's the reason that we have all these layers of prayer built in. And we continue to add them, and I continue to nag about it. Somebody, if you're a member of this church, is praying for you by name every day. On Monday, it's healing, by the way, in case you wondered. Tomorrow will be your healing day. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that right, Tom? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. In case you're a little short on money, Friday's Prosperity Day. <laughs> so I keep you up to date. In case you wonder, there's a book on it. You can take it home and, and do it yourself with all the scriptures that go with each one of the seven days. So it's not a big mystery. <laughs> anyway, well, why did you put them on those days? Because that's the order I thought of them in. I've been praying that way for our leadership for years and years and years and years and years. And so when we spread it out to everybody else, they just got the same list I had. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> so everybody that's a member gets prayed for. Every, uh, during the week, there are two-person teams all around the community, our points of light prayer teams, that agree to pray for the needs that we know of in the church and their agreement in that is that sometime during this week, we'll get together and agree together over these needs and pray for the church. Amen. Sometime. I don't care. You can do it at 6 in the morning. You can do it on Thursday afternoon. I don't care. Amen. But we got 20-some-odd people that pray in pairs somewhere for an hour every week over a list of prayer needs. Somebody got, got a prayer sheet with you? Every Sunday, you see people running around here handing these out. That's because the things that we've identified that we know of that need to be prayed for this week are listed here, and those people go home with this stuck in their Bible, and then sometime during the week they take an hour and pray over those things. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when you call in prayer needs to the front office or we find out uh, inadvertently that you need prayer, it goes on that list and you get prayed for. If it's an emergency, you call in and, and uh, you know, you're, you, you're bleeding out. You're on your way to the hospital. Don't laugh. You get some funny calls. You're on your way to the hospital. <laughs> Amen. Well, then there's, there's an email list of people that if you call the office, Jan sends out a, an email alert right away to start praying now. Amen. Or if, uh, if you call one of us, we've all got the same list, and it goes on uh, to that email uh, prayer list. It goes now. Amen. So we can pray for emergencies. Praise God. Are you with me? Amen. And then every day of the week, seven days a week, somebody comes in and prays in this church, I started saying the sanctuary, but Sunday's not in the sanctuary because there's other things happening in the sanctuary on Sunday. And, but but uh, seven days a week, somebody prays in this church for an hour concerning the issues that are going on in the church that we know about, concerning the services on Sunday, concerning the services on Tuesday, concerning the outreaches of the church, whatever else needs to be prayed for that can be communicated. Amen. 
And then on Sunday morning, we changed that just this week. They're praying from 8 to 9 back in the, in the multi-purpose room. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It used to be the, the uh, uh, cry room. But now we're using it for other things as well. So it's the multi-purpose room. You're not required to cry if you go in there anymore. <laughs> but from 8 to 9, praying for the service. Why? Because we want the power of God to be manifest. We want needs to be met. Amen. We don't, want, we don't want people to be distracted from the things of God as they're sitting in the service. You know the devil will come to church if you're not careful? Every Sunday of the world, I tell him he's not welcome here. I learned that the hard way. He used to come and disturb my services all the time. And then one Sunday morning, he said, well, if you tell him to not come, he won't. Shoot. I did, and you know he ain't done it since? 20-something years now. I don't let him tear up my services. Amen. Amen. It's one of those things where I was praying to God, and God said, I already took care of that. Why don't you do what I told you to do? Oh, okay. Oh, God, please protect us. Why? <laughs> anyway, so we have those people praying here every day. So if you call in with a prayer request, somebody will get that, and they'll be praying right here every day of the world. And if something comes up that's a chronic problem, somebody's really having a hard time physically, and they're just standing and standing and standing, I have people, we call it the Romans 826. Amen. Prayer warriors. I hate to use that term in public because you'll think you're trying to get people to fight, but you know what I'm talking about. Amen. They're willing to take on a prayer project. Yeah. Romans 8, 26 is where it says that the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. We're talking about interceding in the Holy Ghost for people until, bless God, we get them healed. Yeah. Amen. How long will it take until we get them healed? Amen. <laughs> Amen. So I have a whole list of people that volunteered to be on that list. And uh, we've, uh, I, I think I shared with you last week, we've got two supernatural victories already out of that crowd. So if we got things that don't seem to be responding to all this other stuff that we got in place, and the devil's got in and got on somebody, we got people that are willing to get in and just whoop him until he gets off. Come on. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So, as you can tell, I've gotten really serious about this praying for each other deal. And there is a plan in place, and it, bless God, works. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. A real church prays. Amen. So, I said all that to say this. I need you to pray for me. Paul said, pray for me. If Paul needed prayer, I suspect I will too. Amen. So pray for me. I've got stuff to do and not a lot of time to do it in. Amen. I got an assignment uh, that seemed bigger than, than Dallas uh, to get done by 2020. I'm running as fast as I can run. And then I got this church thing going on. Amen. And I'm committed. If I get up here to speak to you on Sunday morning, I want to be able to bring you thus saith the Lord. Not somebody else has warmed over last chapter of their book. <laughs> Y'all looking at me. I can't tell you how many services I've been to. A guy gets up and preaches. I say, that's so-and-so's book. I recognize it anywhere. And then I got to know some pastors real well, and uh, they, they didn't even, weren't even ashamed of it. They'd be re t preaching somebody else's book. <laughs> Amen. I felt obligated to hear from heaven. Amen. <laughs> I remember John Osteen said, uh, just get in the Word, stay in the Word, stay in prayer, and then get up and preach out of the overflow. <laughs> That's pretty good advice. Amen. So if I ever get up and preach about three or four minutes and then just sit down, you'll know it's because I didn't have much time that week. <laughs> That's all I had. I can't remember ever that happening, but it might happen. You never know. Amen. So pray for me. Amen. And then this year, uh, the Lord spoke to me. Uh, while we were at uh, the leadership meeting in November um, with a, a tongue and an interpretation, and he said several different things, but one of them he said, he said there'd be a new level and a new anointing in the flow of the Spirit this year. I mean, well, there is, and it's going to get better. Yeah. But in order for that to happen, uh, that goes, he, he brought back to me a, a time back in 1989 when I was praying in the Holy Ghost on the floor of the prayer room in our little church in Oneonta, New York. And uh, he spoke to me out of Isaiah chapter 50. You know what's in Isaiah chapter 50? 
You don't know what's in Isaiah chapter 50? What's the matter with you? He said, in Isaiah chapter 50, he said, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that's weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Now, that's a messianic prophecy. I understand that, so don't get exegetical on me. But uh, back in 1989, I'm laying on the floor, and the Lord spoke to me out of that passage. I had to go look it out. Amen. And he said, there will come a day when you'll stand and speak, thus saith the Lord, and I'll waken you in the night. Well, those of it, that's happened off and on over the years. But ever since I got that back in November, he's been waking me up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, every morning, talking to me. First, I thought it was something I ate, but then I, I, I took time to pray in the Holy Ghost, and there wasn't any distress about it. It was just, okay, you're awake now. Amen. And I bugged him about it, and he said, I said I would awaken you morning by morning. This is that. Amen. So he talks to me early in the morning, and I come down here and tell y'all. Amen. I told you, he said that this year would be a little more inspirational in the preaching department. Well, that's what I meant. Amen. But then secondly, uh, we're going to get more and more serious about moving people out of the pew and into the harvest. I need you to pray for me, all right, uh, but we need to pray for one another that the saints in the pews will rise up and fulfill all the will of God. If you'll remember back in August, we talked about in Colossians chapter 4, that precious scripture about Epaphras over there in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Let's turn there as my musicians come up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He said there that Epaphras, Paul said he was a servant of Christ Jesus. He's striving earnestly for you in his prayers. Remember we talked about striving earnestly. It was agonizomai. It means grabbing hold of and wrestling with. Groaning and moaning and carrying on. In his, he, ain't, he ain't just saying, oh, God bless him. He's saying, God. Amen. He was praying for them that they would stand perfect and mature, complete and mature in all the will of God. We need to be praying for one another. Amen. That each one of us will stand complete, mature, perfect, and firm in all the will of God. Why? Because if the saints stand perfect and mature in all the will of God, that reaching Tucson will be an effect, not a program. Amen. Are you listening to me? Let's stand up. Everybody say, a real church prays. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what the Lord gave me this morning. Impacting Tucson, the Word and the Spirit, keeping it real. In order to be real, it must start in the Spirit. It must be birthed by the Spirit. It must be birthed in the Spirit. It must be carried out in the power and the anointing of the Spirit. Everything else is man's program, man's effort, and man's glory. Let the praying continue. Glory to God. Look at somebody and say, let the praying continue. The praying Hallelujah. Continue. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hear my cry, O Lord. Attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry out to thee. Listen to this now. And when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, it's higher than I. For thou hast been, for thou hast been, a shelter unto me. Oh, a high tower, Lord. A high tower, Lord. Against the enemy. Oh, glory. And when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. That is higher than I. That is higher than I. I'll sing that again when my heart. And when my heart is overwhelmed, please. 
lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I like that. Sing it again. That is higher than I. When my heart and when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, that's higher than I. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Lift your hands up to him. If you came here this morning overwhelmed, if I got a deal for you, I know a rock that you can stand on. I know a rock that'll let you stand in the cleft of his very own heart and see his goodness. Hallelujah. I know a rock. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. If you came this morning overwhelmed by life and the situations in it, just lift your hands up right now. We're going to look. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Pour out your spirit now on these precious folks whose hearts are overwhelmed. Bring refreshing from heaven, Lord. Times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Strengthen them with might by your spirit in their inner man that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith, that they'd be rooted and grounded in love, unable to comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, that they'd know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, filled afresh with all the fullness of God. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. With your heads bowed just a moment, if you came this morning and you've never professed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never given your life to Him, proclaimed Him to be your Lord. You believe He died for your sin. You believe He's raised from the dead, but you've never made a commitment to follow Him. Then today is your day. You need to take that step of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray with you before we go. If that's you, would you lift your hand and wave at me? I don't want anybody to leave here and miss heaven just because I didn't pray for them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to look around the room. If that's you, wave at me so I can see you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Let's just lift our hands up. Sing that song one more time. Hear my cry. Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Attend unto my prayer. And from the ends of the earth will I cry out to thee when my heart and when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I that is higher than I I'll sing that again when my heart is overwhelmed and when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, it's higher than I. Heavenly Father, I believe that you hear that prayer because you put it in your word. I believe that you heard it. And I believe because we know you heard it, that we believe we have the petitions that we desired from you. We know it. We have it now. I thank you for strengthened and encouraged hearts this day. I thank you for people in the cleft of the rock. I praise you and thank you for as I commit them to your care in Jesus' name. Amen. If, if you want to be a part of one of those prayer teams that we talked about and you're interested in doing that and you're not now, come see me and we'll get you plugged in. Amen. Go get some coffee.